Welcome back to What is Judaism? I'm the Average Rabbi, and I'm here with Joe. Hello. Thanks, Joe. Today's episode is Section 2, Chapter 8. Getting into the details of Hashem's Hashkocha, His oversight and management. Number one. What we need to understand about the Hashkocha of Hashem is that every manner of it, the way it operates, it's all according to what's right, according to the law. As it says in Psalms, the staff of fairness is the staff of your kingship. And it also says in Mishlein Proverbs, the king upholds the land with judgment. Mm. So things are very exact. Now we know that Hashem's only goal here is to benefit humanity. Now Hashem loves His creation the way a father loves his child. It's just that from that love itself, it's proper that a father should discipline his child in order to ultimately benefit him as the child grows. It says in the book of Deuteronomy that just as a father disciplines his son, so to Hashem your God disciplines you. And now it comes out that we see that the fact that there is judgment and, dare we say, punishment in the world is itself an expression of love. It comes, it flows forth from the source of love. And the discipline of Hashem is not a vengeful strike. Like some people might imagine, if you offend God, you'll be struck by lightning. Right, well, we talk about the wrath of Hashem every day in the Shema. So it, sound, it sounds, it does from that uh, sound a little bit like there's some anger involved and maybe... Uh, Hashem, dis- correct. Hashem displays anger to us just as a father might display his anger to his child in order to discipline the child. But it's all for our ultimate benefit. Okay. And even though the face is anger and wrath and judgment, what's behind it, the, the root cause for why Hashem is expressing that toward us is his love for us, that this is somehow beneficial for our growth. Okay, so it's not, yeah, it's not a vengeance thing. That makes right. Sense. But it's the, it's the discipline of a father that wants the goodness for his child. Now, from this principle, we now have two concepts that come up. Number one is that the judgment itself, any discipline that Hashem gives people, will already be sweetened and not harsh and cruel because the love itself tempers that judgment with mercy so it's already anything that we experience that we might feel is difficult we should know that it's already being naturally tempered could be much worse there's there's much worse that is deserved the hasheni and the second that there are times when it's necessary, Hashem will completely override the system and suspend judgment completely. And Hashem will operate using the trait of mercy, as it says in the book of Exodus, and I have had grace on those who I will have grace on, and I have been merciful on those I will be merciful upon. And what that means, what that verse means, is that Hashem is choosing to use a trait of mercy in lieu of judgment to suspend that judgment. Now, since Hashem's goal, what Hashem really wants, 
is for man to use free will. This is the purpose of everything, as we've explained. We need to be activated. And so, therefore, the methods that Hashem uses to operate in this world and extend judgment, it's all going to be in accordance with our actions. Now, not all of it was, we'll see in a second, but generally speaking, now it's as if Hashem is making his behavior dependent upon ours. That Hashem will only benefit someone or bring some sort of negativity upon someone in accordance with their actions. So now it seems that Hashem is subjugated to our decisions. Well, yeah, and this seems a little bit different from the concept that, you know, my my paycheck doesn't come from my boss, it comes from Hashem. We we understand this, and this seems to be saying that, well, he's built in this fair system of, of justice and, and reward. Uh, so, no, your paycheck comes from the fact that you did the work. That's not really his point here, because that point is true, that, yes, Hashem is the one that gives the paycheck. It looks like it comes from your work. There's this illusion of this world that's being set up. His point here is that everything that happens to a person, Hashem is doing it, but he does it only in response to things that we do. Mm. Oh, so that's what he's saying by subjugating his will to ours. Yes. Interesting. Right. It, it, all, it, it looks as if that Hashem is uh, somewhat passive, that we take the initiative and determine things in the world using our free will, and Hashem responds with something appropriate mm. in order to facilitate the ultimate goal. Now the truth is that Hashem is not actually subjugated to anything, to any rule or law. He is not dependent, does not need anything, and is not affected by anything. Now, when he wants to operate and do something, there is nothing that is actually pushing Hashem to do anything or preventing Hashem. Hashem is in complete control and operates 100% independently. But when it comes to the way Hashem uses judgment in this world, He manages it in a way that is subjugated to our actions because that's His choice and it fulfills what He wants. Now, when Hashem decrees that He is going to suspend judgment, as we've mentioned, he is using his trait of loftiness, the, the trait of unity and complete dominion. And he ignores the destruction that we've done with our sin and fixes all of the damage with divine power on his own, without our intervention, with our, without our having to fix it. So now it comes out that really there's two types of hashgacha, two types of management structures. Hashgachos Hashem Yisbarach, there is the hashgacha of Hashem, which is interesting to say, it's like, it sounds like the other one won't be Hashem, the hashgachas hashlita v'hayichud. What that means is the first type of hashgacha, the hashgacha of Hashem Yisbarach, that is the responsive hashgacha, that Hashem is reacting, so to speak, to what we do, and that's ideal. So that's why it uses the term Hashem is because it's related to the aspect of judgment. Hashem is uh, is not a trait of judgment. Hashem is a nickname. Oh right, no, that's Elohim. Correct. Okay. Right. So he's but he's using the word Hashem as opposed to the Hashgacha of Shlita the Yehud of dominion and unity, which doesn't have any relation to us at all. It's a complete system override. So plan A is man uses free will effectively or ineffectively, and Hashem will respond to that and react and change the world appropriately with that. Sometimes it becomes necessary to do a complete system override. 
And so we have these two different hashkachos. And with these two paths of Hashkacha, Hashem oversees constantly all of creation. Because with his Hashkacha, he is constantly judging every single action. And he is using his Hashkacha of dominion, the system override, to fix up and manage the entire universe, making sure that everything is still on track and moving in the right direction. Because really both of these things are necessary. It can't be that with our actions, with our free will, we will derail the entire system. Hashem has promised that things will end up where they are supposed to end up, that there will be an ultimate rectification to everything. And so therefore, it seems like that might not be compatible with our free will. What if Mm -hmm. we decide to sabotage it. Right. So we have these two systems operating hand in hand that one is working together with us the way things are supposed to. And then another one is when it becomes necessary to redirect the train and make sure things are still on the right track. Well, so there is there is a question that comes up, and I think I may know the answer to it, but it, it of course, pops into my head when we talk about this, if, if the train's going to be redirected, then why spend a bunch of time and effort uh, trying to send it in the right direction to begin with? The, this is a very deep question. And there, there are several answers. And there are several layers to answering this question. On a personal level, it matters tremendously. Because as Mordechai told Esther in the Purim story, There will be salvation for the Jewish people, for the world. Not you, someone else. Right. Do you want, the question is, do you want to be part of this? You have the opportunity to choose to be part of the system or not. Mm -hmm. Do you want, what's your place? Wow. So on a personal, and on a personal level is the only thing that's actually relevant to any one of us. Everything else is just theoretical. Why is it necessary for me to contribute if it's going to happen anyway? The answer is, well, it will happen anyway. But what's going to be with your existence? Mm. Okay, so that is different from the answer I had imagined. Um, but your answer is better. Uh, mine was just going to be that, you know, we're we get to have some say in how pleasant or painful history becomes for the Jewish people. That's also true. There, there's a controversial teaching from the Nitziv, who, well, he really quotes a a medrash. Essentially, there are two paths to the end goal. You can take one path that seems very convenient now, uh, but the truth is that it's only nice and pleasant for a very short time, the first few steps, and then it gets very thorny and difficult to walk through, and that's the majority of the path. And the other way is quite difficult in the beginning, a lot of obstacles, and it's uncomfortable and challenging. But then after that, it's smooth sailing to the end of the path. So this is his analogy that we have a decision to make. When Hashem says, I've placed before you life and death, goodness and evil, choose life. It's as if Hashem is saying, the end result will be ultimate rectification. But you get to choose how you get there. Mm. One way is pleasant, the other way is not. I beg you, I implore you, choose life. Now, the, the thing that's controversial about that is that it cannot be understood on its face like that, because then it seems that there truly are no eternal consequences. And as we've seen in this book, there are. Right. That there are varying degrees. If, of, the, end, if the end result was truly the same, yeah, it would mean that we're all going, uh, or we're all going to experience the same thing in, in death, which would negate a lot of this. Right. So it could be what he meant is that on a, on a national scale or on a global universal scale that the world will come to its ultimate perfection. Now, that can look like a lot of different things. And it's on an individual level, there could be a lot of variation of who fits into that and who Are doesn't. Are you going to be included or not? In the collective, right, of the perfected ones, as we mentioned earlier. Mm. Number two. Things that you also need to know. 
כי הנה, גם השפעה של תחולק לשני מינים. Also his hashpa'a, his influence, is also divided into two types. Ha'echad hu l'mashal aguf, v'hashenu l'mashal anefesh. One is the influence that Hashem exerts that is relevant to the body, to physical actions and behavior. And the second is to the spiritual, to the nefesh. L'mashal aguf, k'var be'anu b'inyono. What's relevant to the body, to things that happen in this physical world, we've explained at length in this section. When it comes to a person's success or how easy they have it in this world. So we've explained a lot about that and what reasons go into that and how it works. Now, there is also an influence, a divine influence on the spiritual nature of what happens in this world. And that is in a person's intellect, in their awareness, in their consciousness, in their conscience. And the closeness that a person experiences to Hashem. And also the value and elevation of their soul. Now, he's going to describe utopia. What is the perfect ideal world? Hmm. Before, we, before we get into what he says, this is a good thought experiment that I want to share. Let's take any profession that we deem to be noble, some noble pursuit, like a doctor. Yes, a doctor, a scientist, someone uh, who works with nonprofits to feed the hungry, people who make clothing for the poor, etc., all of these things that are noble pursuits that we can imagine that I think most of humanity, r- religious or not, would agree that these are good mm-hmm. things to do. Let's say we develop enough technology that all of those things become obsolete. All right, so there's no more sickness. You don't need a, a doctor anymore. No sickness, no hunger. We, we can develop food and nutrients, mm-hmm. you know, at, with an infinite supply, clothing, shelter, it's all taken care of. There is no need. There's no lack in physicality. Let's say we develop technology to the point where we are successful in meeting everyone's needs. What then? What will people do with their time? <laughs> what, what, is, what is the world about at that point? It's a good question. It is, and I... I encourage you to think about it, listeners at home, if you haven't already. If you're this far in the book, you, maybe you have an answer. But I would imagine that a lot of people, without maybe admitting it or thinking about it too deeply, if they would actually be in that position, which is where we are now, people would be focused on entertainment, which is a lot of what our society is focused on right now because we live in abject luxury. And so we focus so much on keeping ourselves feeling good. Well, I know you and I have talked about, um, I, I know we've, we've talked about this specifically, but then also recently, uh, like how few of your, your hours you have to spend in a week to earn enough money to cover your food. To survive. Right. I mean, it used to be that people just lived subsistence livings where you worked on the farm to make enough food. And if you did really well, you'd have enough food for the year. And if you didn't, you wouldn't have enough food for the year. But right. that was the extent of what you did. And now it's like, you know, a few hours of your work each week goes toward your food bill. And a few hours goes toward your rent and, you know, your cell phone, et cetera, et cetera. And it's so few hours in total that you still have at least that many hours outside of work, waking hours where you need to figure out what to do with yourself. We developed so many devices to save time. We needed to start inventing devices to kill it. (laughs) That's a tragedy. So this is his description of utopia. This is from the Jewish perspective. Number one is that people are deeply connected to wisdom, to divine wisdom, and are busy with divine service of their creator. And truth will be revealed and clear. 
and the wicked will be downtrodden, subjugated to the rest, and all deceit will be tossed away. And the only service, the only work and value that will be in the world will be directed toward Hashem. And all good character traits will be fully expressed and dominant. And negative character traits will be despised. And in accordance with all of this, there will be peace and tranquility in the world. And there won't be any suffering. There will be no pain and damage. And Hashem will manifest His glory in the world. And He will rejoice over His creations. And the creation will rejoice and be happy before Him. Sounds great. It's fantastic. Right. That's the goal. <laughs> That's the, the world as it should be. And the opposite of all this, dystopia. That's when people are swept away by their physical desires. And they despise divine wisdom. They're far from it. And they don't try working even a little bit, or not at all. And truth becomes not a value anymore. And the wicked become powerful and take over. And deceit and distortion become rampant. And there are all kinds of crazy ideologies that are being pursued in the world, good, pure character traits become hard to find, concealed. And negative character traits are plentiful. And in accordance with that, there will be unrest, no peace. And suffering and damage will be all over. And therefore Hashem will hide His presence from the world. And the world will continue as if it's been abandoned to chance and just operating according to scientific laws of nature. And Hashem will not be happy with His creation the Ain Bene Adam Semech in the fun of, and people will be unhappy. Veloi Makirim Veyodim Mahu Simchas Habrius Lifne Bayram, and they won't understand and know what is the joy of life in front of their Creator. Ubizman Koze, and in a time like this, Haroim Goivrim Vahatoivim Nishpalim, the wicked people are in charge, and good people are are deposed. This is the dystopia. If any of that sounds familiar, wow. We're looking around at the world and seeing which where is our society headed? Right, it seems like if those are opposite ends of a spectrum, I'm concerned that we align a little more with the second one. Right. And I don't want to be a doomsayer and and be such a pessimist. To, to say that the world is so terrible. We hear enough of that. I'm grateful for, for the world that we have. It's wonderful. But right. There's, this, it, it is concerning to see, looking outward, uh, the things that seem to align with, with this, what you just described. There is a culture in the world that is becoming more and more dominant, and it is aligned with this dystopia. And that's what it's pushing for. And even though there, there still is a tremendous amount of goodness in the world. Mm. So I guess this is where I, I really am a pessimist. Is it could get a lot worse. <laughs> and, it, and I believe it will. Um, because there's no slowing down in this culture. And we need, 
we, we need to be under no misconception that there is a war happening in the world and there are only two sides. There are people that are fighting on the side of Hashem who know there is a God and are fighting for truth and there's the opposite. And there are a lot of people that are just ignorant to the war, just don't right. understand. What about the people who are, who are somewhere in between who maybe uh, aren't firmly on the side of Hashem uh, but are probably pretty decent people. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, in a war like this, without strong convictions to be on the side of God, it is very tempting to be swept along with the other side. It's true. I don't know how much uh, how much defense you would have against you know what they're describing, the pursuit of physical desires uh, and things of that nature, just the infinite entertainment. How much defense would you have against that unless you had something really strong to moor yourself to? And what could that possibly be in the absence of God? Right. So we wouldn't call them wicked, but we would call them casualties of war. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to fight. The people who do have convictions need to understand that this is serious. And we need to exert as much, po as much positive influence as we possibly can. Not to not to judge people or put them down and you know doomsaying on the corners but to spread goodness mm -hmm. to spread truth real light in the world it's an obligation it's more necessary now than maybe ever before i see now with this idea of the utopia and the dystopia these are results of hashem's influence in the world as we've mentioned before there are all kinds of physical events that could occur and that has with Hashem's hashkacha. What he's describing now is that's a result of Hashem's hashba, his influence on the physical world, everything we spoke about before. And now with this sort of spiritual attitude of the world is also a result of Hashem's hashba, Hashem's influence on the spiritual characteristics of society at large. This is what I just said, that there is hashba that comes from Hashem that has to do with the body, and there's hashba that comes from Hashem that has to do with the soul. Number three. We already explained back in section one, chapter four. And this is going to be a whole recap of that chapter, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. The state of man in this world. It's a reality, it's a state where physicality dominates. And darkness is what is the root of everything. And light is combined with it. So the foundation of our physical reality now as it is, is physicality and darkness, and it has been tempered and combined with light. And that is where the conscience and the consciousness come from. At the beginning of the creation of a human being, of a person, a person is irrational and has very little intelligence. And as the child grows, so his maturity of intellect will be more and more developed. Now, the reason for all of this reality, the actual root cause of having that intellect and awareness and that development of maturity, that it comes from the influence from Hashem. Because everything, in accordance with how Hashem is exerting influence into the world and into a person, to that degree is what you will find show up in this world, in that person, in a general sense and on a specific level as well. And the root of everything, if you trace it back far enough, is the revelation of Hashem's light or the concealment, like we explained back in section 1, chapter 4. This is the cause, the, the actual root of good and evil, respectively, that show up in this world, 
are the light of Hashem or the concealment of that light. Vihine. The degree of light that comes forth of Hashem's revelation of His countenance or the concealment of that is in accordance with how Hashem decrees it. From the influence of light comes ribui, which is blessing, zakus, which could be translated as clarity, but it really means a purity, like the purity when something is distilled. And yakar, which means value. And from the influence of the concealment of Hashem's light comes deficiency and murkiness and lowliness. And in order to facilitate the existence of things in this world, there needs to be a deep confluence of both of these elements of light and the concealment of that light. There's a combination of the two. Because with anything that exists in this world, and we have to understand there is no thing that exists that is purely perfect in any one element. Everything has an element of deficiency. Everything has an element of purity and lack. They're all mixed together. Everything that exists has a complexity to it of some things are positive and some things are negative. And they all have all of these elements. Inyane shiflus v'inyane yakar, lowliness, value. Alkein ha'ashpah shetushpah lehem lufi ma'ashroi hi matzebam, tzarek shi'ya b'inyane harkavos mina ha'ara u'mina hester. And so therefore, in order to facilitate all of these elements of completion and deficiency and value and lack of value, in order for all of these elements to exist, there must be at its source, when you trace it back, a confluence, a combination of light from Hashem and a concealment of that light in a very specific order and combination. There's a code almost that shows up in this world as any object. So the way things are ordered, the way this light is ordered and combined and set at varying degrees of level of intensity, all of these combinations create down here in this world something that exists with definition. This is the general principle of everything that exists and everything that happens in the world. So that's some pretty high-level abstract stuff, but we needed to come back to that for just a moment for the following. Okay, so everything in existence is composed of basically a, a very specific combination of light and darkness and each of the traits that we mentioned or or each of the specific qualities that we mentioned contained with each of within each of those uh, both both for its existence and also for the uh, it, its natural traits or, or its nature I guess you could say sure everything all of it and everything that happens to it as well correct okay it's all built on these combinations of light and concealment number four when we zoom out and look at the entire world from its inception, from the creation of time and space, everything that has happened up until now in history, and everything that has been prophesied to happen in the future, Nimsa Badavar Arba Hadragas. It turns out that there are four stages. And now let's imagine all of humanity as one person. From the time that this person, mankind, is born, the origins of humanity, until its final maturation. Now let's go through these four stages. The first one. Where 
that irrationality and darkness is what's dominant, totally taking over the mind. That there's a lack of knowledge of the truth of God in his completion and how we are meant to understand and relate to God. And this is what our sages have nicknamed the 2,000 years of chaos. And that was the, from the time of Adam until 2,000 years later, from the time about Avram, when Abraham came mm-hmm. on the scene, those 2,000 years, more or less, were the time of chaos. Okay, and so the concept of the, the decline of the generations comes basically since Avram, it sounds like. Right, or Mount Sinai. Okay. Yeah, and th- that process, those few hundred years from Abraham until Moses receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai are considered the transition period. Hamatzav mm-hmm. Hashem. Now, by the way, even though we said those are the first 2,000 years, it's a little bit confusing because the stages he's about to name are not in chronological order. As we'll see, Hamatzav Hashem, the second stage, this is a better state of humanity than what we've mentioned before. And that is the time that we are currently in now. Stage two. We have, with gratitude to God, a knowledge of his existence. And we have Torah Hashem Itonu with us. And we have the ability to serve Hashem appropriately with confidence that we know what we're doing. Amnam, however, ein os ve ein navi, there are no miracles, there are no prophets, ve chaseiro ha'askolo ha'amitis shehi ruach ha'kodesh, and we are lacking a true intellect, a direct connection to Hashem through the divine spirit, through ruach ha'kodesh, as we'll explain what that is later in the book. Ki amnam, mashia adam maskil besichlai ayidei iskoi ha'anoshi, because what a person can comprehend using just the standard human intellect in comparison with the intellect that is bestowed upon a person with divine spirit, seichel nishba, an intellect which has been influenced by God directly. It's like the difference between the body and the soul. And so there's a massive qualitative difference between what we are capable of now even though it's true from an intellectual perspective, we have access to God, but it's not direct. The intellect is, a, is on a completely different level. Mats of Shlishi, now the third stage, Toiv Mizeh, is better than that. Huba Mats of Zman Besamikdosh. That is the state of humanity when we have a Besamikdosh, a temple. Shekavar Hayu Oisis Umavsim Unavua Samin Adam. We had open miracles and prophecy. Ach, however, even though it was possible to become a prophet, this was not extended to the entirety of, of mankind, rather to select individuals. And even for them, it was difficult to achieve. There were barriers, things holding them back from achieving it. It was possible to reach that level, but it was very difficult. That was stage three. Matzav Revi, Toiv Mikulam. The fourth stage is the best of all. This is what our prophets have foretold in the times to come. There will be no distortion of the intellect at all. And divine spirit will be poured upon every single human being without any difficulty or barrier. At that point, it will be considered as if the building of man has been built, has been created. Because from there and onward, there is only elevation. And for eternity, there will be pleasure. That sounds... All right, so I'm... Maybe I'm being dense here. I just... I well, we are in stage two. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, I, I Maybe I'm just bothered by the fact that stage two comes chronologically after stage three. 
I don't I don't think I understand um, the why the analogy is like the life cycle of a man. That certainly happens chronologically. I right. Well, why we, why does it help us to count it out this way? I mean, it seems like things have just been more of a roller coaster, where where there was the two thousand years of chaos, followed by enlightenment and the base amygdash, and then now we're, we're pretty low. Right. Well, we didn't actually jump straight to stage three. So first of all, the answer to your question is we're, we're not describing chronological uh, states. We're describing qualitative states of humanity. So there's level one, level two, level three, level four. We happen to be back down at level two because we reverted after the destruction of the temple. Do we have to get back up to level three before we reach level four? Well, when Mashiach comes, that will be level four. So I imagine we'll jump straight there. So why why would it happen this way? Why would we jump from stage one to three, revert down to two, and then go to four? <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, if if this, I, I I believe I believe that the Ramchal knows what he's talking about. There's a reason he made this analogy with the life cycle of a person, and just I don't think I quite understand. Right. So I, definitely we start with stage one and we end with stage four. Agreed. Right? And that is the maturity. It's in the middle that we've reverted. That seems to break the order. You know, does man do that in his life? Um, it seems like know, that that's Adam did that. Right. True. But as an analogy, right, as a person grows from mm. a child and then maturing to an adult, right. the, the analogy sort of falls apart. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you if you're if you're very bothered by this. I'll be okay. <laughs> okay. It's it probably is my lack of understanding of, you know, I'm also dense. I'm also in, here in stage 2 with you. All right, someone come from stage 3, please help us out here. Okay. Number 5. And when it comes to the influence of the soul influence, the divine influence on people's spiritual nature that we mentioned earlier way in the beginning of this chapter. We also find definitions within time and space, among other conditions. We find that there are certain times where Hashem's presence is more revealed than it would be at other times. And he's specifically referencing holidays, right? Think these things that we know, but Yom Kippur, Shabbos. So we'll get into the applications later on, but we should just be aware that built into reality as well, there is within the category of hashba'a, influence on the soul on the spiritual nature of things it is related to time and space so there are times that are quote unquote more holy where there's more of a revelation of Hashem's light than other times and also within space there are spaces there are places in the world where Hashem's presence can be more revealed than in other places now obviously this does not mean that Hashem is in one place more than another place. It means that there are certain places that conduct Hashem's revelation more than others. And all of this, like everything else, is very exact according to a perfect system. All in accordance with what is going to be the ultimate perfection of reality. And so this is what our holidays depend on, and holy places. That there is a higher level of influence that can a person can tap into in those times, in those places. And a person can receive a higher degree of a revelation of Hashem, that distilled purity of goodness, elevation, 
all in accordance with what that time or space is. So is that revelation, is that also limited in time with the holiday? Or can that be longer lasting? Um, can, he, can he take that with him? Anything can change you. Anything you can, you can use that and hold on to it. Yes. But access, direct access to it is only available during that time. Okay. With that, we have concluded not only chapter eight, but all of section two. In next episode, God willing, we will start section three, discussing the nature of man's soul and all of its properties. Sounds great. Thank you, Rabbi.